One thing I love about genre filmmaking is that the genre kind of provides you with this like very sturdy framework that you can kind of lay messier emotions onto and you can tell a very personal story but it like provides you with like a very kind of strict path that you have to adhere to. And it also forces you to kind of find the catharsis in that story. I just wanted to write a breakup movie and I saw a way of marrying the breakup movie that I had in, at the time with the structure of a folk horror film. Rather than reviewing Midsommar in full, I wanted to focus on one aspect of it. It's genre. I'm mostly going to be pulling from an LA Times piece by Mark Olson, who interviewed Astor and others who worked on the film, and a folkhorrorrevival.com piece by author and artist Andy Pachorik called From the Forests, Fields, and Furrows. Andy Pachorik's piece goes deep into what the term folk horror encompasses, though he never pretends to narrow the term down into a distinct definition. As he says, one may as well attempt to build a box the exact shape of mist, for like the mist, Folk horror is atmospheric and sinuous. It can creep from and into different territories, yet leave no universal defining mark of its exact form. But the unholy trinity of folk horror films are a good place to start, and as he says, some have come to define folk horror as British movies of the late 1960s and 70s that have a rural, earthy association to ancient European pagan and witchcraft traditions or folklore. From the late 60s, a new generation of British directors avoided the gothic cliches by stepping even further away from the modern world. Amongst these are a loose collection of films which we might call folk horror. They shared a common obsession with the British landscape, its folklore and superstitions. Witchfinder General, directed by Michael Reeves, took us back to the witch hunts of 17th century East Anglia. It may have cast horror legend Vincent Price in the lead role, but this was new territory, dark and nihilistic. The Wicker Man may have become the cult film, and Witchfinder General may have grabbed most of the critical plaudits, but there's another film which I think deserves much wider appreciation. What makes it so special? Well, let's just say there aren't many films set in the reign of William and Mary in which the devil rebuilds his body by harvesting the skin of children. The film is Blood on Satan's Claw, and its director, Piers Haggard, also drew inspiration from the countryside of the home counties. What kind of a horror film were you setting out to make? I didn't want to do something which was, which was um, larky, and uh, uh, I wasn't really interested in Dracula, um, I, I, but I was interested in the dark things that people feel and the dark things that happen. And um, that was what I wanted to explore. And I think the other thing that appealed to me really was the setting, the, the, the rural setting. He says, a theory put forward on the Free Radio Santa Cruz folk horror edition of the Other Side of the Tracks music show suggests that folk horror of that period emerged from a sense of post-hippie disillusionment in which the ideals of the Back to the Land movement no longer seemed ideal. Coupled with the 1960s resurgence of interest in paganism and the occult, folk horror movies arose when, to paraphrase a line from horror writer Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, the ground became sour. There's a sort of little moment of, of uh, folk horror, I suppose, which is absolutely distinct. Do you think that was something to do with the times? Uh, this is very interesting, this. Um, I think that I, I did was tried to make a folk horror film in a way because we were all a bit interested in witchcraft. We were all a bit interested in free love. The rules of the cinema were changing and nudity became possible indeed altogether possibly over prevalent because the lid had slightly been taken off. A BFI piece on folk horror describes the trilogy's films as working through an emphasis on landscape which subsequently isolates its communities and individuals skewing the dominant moral and theological systems enough to cause violence, human sacrifices, torture, and even demonic and supernatural summonings. Pachorik recounts Adam Scoville's list of folk horror elements, landscape, isolation, skewed moral beliefs, and a happening slash summoning, and argues for or against each. He says folk horror is related to psychogeography, the hidden landscape of atmospheres, histories, actions and characters which charge environments. The nooks and crannies of woodland, the edges of fields, the plowing, 
the labour, the sense of the soil, was something that I tried to bring into the picture. It was important for me for the rest of the film to have the camera often very low. So we dug an awful lot of holes, put the camera in, just to give you the feeling that we were somehow in the earth and what it was might come out of the earth. It says that folk horror films and backwoods horror films regardless of location, often share the factor of a principal character or characters finding themselves amongst people who do not think or act the way they do, often with dire consequence. Without a doubt, the best known of this group of films is The Wicker Man. Set on idyllic summer isle, it pits the pagan islanders against the upstanding Christian hero, with its horrific conclusion played out in daylight. It's fun in theory. Uh, to make a film in daylight, and then it's a nightmare in practice. Um, you're chasing the sun all day, which also means that you're chasing continuity. But I know that we were very excited about making a film that, uh, that was very beautiful and kind of inviting, even as it gets darker and darker. And, you know, whether you're making a film in, you know, utter darkness or, you know, broad daylight, uh, the goal is always to make something beautiful. And that the happening slash summoning that falls close to the conclusion of such films may involve a supernatural element, such as an invocation of a demon, or it may be an entirely earthly, though no less horrific, event such as an act of violence or a ritual sacrifice. The website in general says, one point that should be clarified is that folk horror is less about horror, at least traditional definitions of horror, than may be first thought. What separates folk horror from the simply folk is a certain sense of dislocation from the comfortable world. But it is a dislocation that does not necessarily have to be frightening. It is the difference between a dusty window and an old cottage, and that same window framing an indistinct face peering out. Pachorik's piece is dense. He describes the origins of the term folk horror, folk horror in other mediums, and how it overlaps with other genres, especially science fiction, and many examples from different time periods all over the world. But rather than giving the full account as he does, and as other websites try to do, I'm going to take the lead Pachorik sets here, when he says, The style of delivery, the atmosphere, and aesthetic are key points. There is frequently an indefinable certain something that makes a work appear more or less folk horror. It is not a simple subject for analysis, but rather than analyze, perhaps it is better just to relish, to be intrigued by, and to be delightfully afraid of. Enjoy the trek, but do not wander too far from the path. If someone asks me, in conversation, to define folk horror, I just bring up the Wicker Man and describe it. Even never having seen it in full, I have on hand what I learned from cultural osmosis and references. An uptight stranger gets stranded in a more natural, seemingly idyllic setting with members of a religion he does not understand, and grows gradually more suspicious and frightened of, until, spoilers, they destroy him as a part of their rituals. And my first exposure to folk horror probably came in those cultural references to films like The Wicker Man in Hot Fuzz, which is a meta comedy action film that was heavily influenced, at least plot-wise, by folk horror. I think folk horror is neat and a subgenre that can either lend itself in pieces to another genre well, or meld with other genres well. Apostle is more folk horror than Hot Fuzz is, but it's still more action-oriented and takes itself less seriously than something like Midsommar. But I did not enjoy or appreciate the folk horror elements of Midsommar. I had so many problems with this movie, but they crystallized when my friend sent me screenshots of that LA Times interview after we saw the movie together. In that interview, Astor said, For me, the film is incidentally a folk horror film. If anything, this is my attempt at making a big operatic breakup movie that feels the way a breakup feels. That sort of makes literal those feelings. Where a breakup can feel apocalyptic, like the world is ending. And so there's a pleasure in taking a movie to that extreme. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I wrote the film during a breakup. Um, I, wanted to re I wanted to write a breakup mo uh, a movie because... Uh, uh, for the same reason that most people prob probably do when they do, and it's because I was going through one. Anybody watching the trailer for Midsommar, you probably know where it's going, right? These people are going to be sacrificed. And so that made it the least interesting thing for me. It was about getting to that inevitable ending in a way that feels emotionally surprising. And my way in was by kind of working through my breakup. Why would you take this genre, this stunning and terrifying and weird amalgam, 
where built in, you have a rich genre history of beautiful settings and horrific violence, or a terrified individual facing a harmonious collective, or the ability to harness those primal fears of loss of self or loss of bodily autonomy, or being trapped waiting to get killed in an unfamiliar and ancient place, or like maybe subverting these tropes through a modern lens. The Way the Witch is a modern feminist folk horror film, or like how modern audiences don't hate hippies. Or maybe you could do something like an apostle where a lot of the villagers are hesitant and sympathetic and suffer along with the outsider main character. Or like Hot Fuzz which kind of parodies the secular cop character. Everything there is so rich and has so much potential. And he's like, Aster's like, oh, it's incidentally a folk horror film. I wanted to talk about my breakup, and for some reason, I took this genre that's arguably about the collective versus the individual and fear of loss of individuality, and the merits of a repressed secular society versus a creepy sex cult where people seem very happy but do weird scary stuff all the time, and I made it about a very specific, very personal event between two people. Because to me, these genre elements, as I chose to apply them, are incidental and predictable and boring. Hereditary is amazing and is deeply disturbing and is imbued with Aster's own fears of his loved ones dying or changing or betraying him or him accidentally harming them and the devastation and guilt that would cause. I mean, there's a saying that life is suffering and I don't <laughs> disagree. Uh, and I, I guess with both of these films, I, want, I, I wanted to make something that takes suffering seriously. I related to it a lot, having dealt with a lot of death, and it terrified me. And... You know, and then otherwise I've, you know, I've, I've, uh, m my family and I have, like, you know, suffered, uh, uh, uh misfortune, you yeah. know, and, yeah. uh, to be cryptic. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I, you draw from, from, Experience. You watch this family who was very sympathetic slowly degrade and die because of forces beyond their control. Midsommar is about a breakup. Esther was not very interested in the ritualistic killing elements, so they're just sort of there. As far as I could tell, there's no supernatural force keeping people on the island or killing them. Like Scandinavian folklore has got all kinds of creatures and monsters in it, and, and is that sort of uh, stuff no. that helped? kind of played into it at all? Or? No, there's there, there's nothing uh, overtly, you know, um, fantastical mm -hmm. here. And at the beginning, nobody's forced to be there. No one's taken there against their will. And there are a lot of opportunities to sneak away as huge red flags pop up one after the other, but nobody does. Especially not the American characters. This is for something for a separate analysis, a separate video, but specifically all of the Americans in this film are just very stupid compared to the European characters, including the other outsiders, not just the scary Swedish people. Most of the American characters are kind of stupid or one note. One is a crass gag character who has weird comedy lines, obviously ADR'd in, that are a little bit distracting, or they're unlikable. Some of the ritualistic kills, in typical Aster fashion, are kind of sickening and upsetting and haunting, especially towards the end, even if the film's narrative doesn't seem to really care that they're happening. And some look kind of stupid and are direct ripoffs of NBC's Hannibal, which did the killings better. Also, there's a rape scene that some interviews and reviews describe as darkly funny. And I think that it's a great device and it challenges an audience um, and, you know, even seeing people's reactions to the film and seeing some people laughing through this, you know, crazy sex scene yeah. and then other people going, what are these people <laughs> laughing at? I think that's really interesting and it's good filmmaking. I guess because a man is the one who's raped and that rape is what pushes the main character to get the character who is raped killed. And I don't have their handle, but they call this the anti boy movie. <laughs> it feels like the film implies or could be very easily misread as implying if it wasn't intentional. That because the character is a man and an asshole, that being heavily drugged and pursued for your seed is somehow having consensual sex and also cheating and makes him- it's like another thing in the list of things that makes him a bad person and a bad boyfriend. There's lots of stuff he does in the movie that is very realistic, classic, bad boyfriend behavior and you understand why the main character is upset with him and unhappy with the relationship. 
but yeah, I don't, I really don't like the way the rhetoric around this film has, has engaged with that scene. I don't think the scene in the film is necessarily terrible. I don't know if you're supposed to like relate to her when she decides to get the villagers to kill him after that. It's pretty terrible, but I think a lot of the response I saw to it found that scene just sort of funny and weird and was like, oh, he deserves it. Oh, watch out. Don't go see this movie with your girlfriend and she'll kill you. And it's just sort of like, Ooh. Additionally, you know, for me, something that was kind of like a big um, enticing factor in it was was this long, drawn out, very humiliating and exposing sort of sequence um, towards the end of the film, you know, with the, with the fate that Christian suffers. And that's something that uh, I think historically has been reserved for females in horror films. But yeah. this was an opportunity to be a male and to put myself into that. Um, perspective which was really interesting and difficult and made me feel vulnerable in a way that I'm sure many actresses have felt over the years. If I look at the rape scene now um, I think it's probably too strong and it's interesting that I, I wasn't bothered at the time. I think you um, will find most directors uh, if they get their teeth into a sequence which is going to be really powerful they become completely seduced, and I was seduced by the sheer dramatic power. Also during the rape scene, there are a bunch of weird, naked women from the village. Some of them are old. The naked old people in Hereditary are really scary and genuinely unnerving because of the context, but out of context, I don't find naked old people scary, and it feels like something Aster is leaning too heavily on. And the Oracle character is just straight up offensive and also not scary. Look at this Fangoria cover. Monsters, aliens, bizarre creatures over the face of a character who is an inbred disabled person. Deliberately performing incest to make an oracle is disturbing, yes, but focusing on a deformed or disabled face as if it's inherently horrific and weird and upsetting in the face of a monster is just shitty. And some of the portrayals of mental illness in this film, especially PTSD and anxiety, are accurate and relatable, and others are just baffling. Like the family death scene at the beginning at the hands of the main character's bipolar sister that I honestly had trouble connecting to the rest of the film tonally and aesthetically, apart from giving the main character a reason to be upset and vulnerable the whole time. Midsommar does shine in scenes where Aster leans more into the surreal horror elements. A nightmare sequence in the film feels like a nightmare. The way one character's face is highlighted, like it's underlit, even though there would be no realistic light source where he is in a car, because it's a nightmare, like that was really creepy and it reminded me of nightmares that I've had. And the hallucinatory effects of drugs characters take added a lot to the film's aesthetic and atmosphere without being unrealistic or cliched or corny. And the film is well shot and often creepy, and it does have a palpable sense of dread, which Aster is very good at, but it still feels long and meandering and tiresome, and I found the way Aster talked about it in interviews just kind of disheartening. David Edelstein's Midsommar review in Vulture ends, After the first press screening, Aster spoke of being approached by Swedish financiers to direct a sort of wicker man-like hack-em-up and rejecting the idea. He thought he had no way into the story until he had a messy breakup and decided he'd take the Swedish money and make the ugliest end of a relationship movie ever. I, I wanted to, when I was writing the film, I, mean, I wanted to write a breakup movie because mm -hmm. I needed to write a breakup movie because I had just gone through a breakup. Okay. Um, and uh, and <clears throat> I saw a way of sort of passing it through this subgenre, the folk horror genre, and kind of you know marrying those two things and. And you know, uh, f finding a way to make this big operatic, just break breakup movie, <laughs> like dark comedy. Mm. I don't know. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, Perhaps Midsummer doesn't gel because its impulses are so bifurcated. It's a parable of a woman's religious awakening. That's also a woman's fantasy of revenge against a man who didn't meet her emotional needs. That's also a male director's masochistic fantasy of emasculation at the hands of a matriarchal cult. Esther seems sure of only one thing, that he wants to make you feel as if your head is being sawed off. 
I feel like this review maybe projects emotions and intentions onto Aster a little too much. I can say I put a lot of myself into both of the characters, and I've been in both positions. I do call the film a horror movie about codependency, and I and, that, and that's sort of what I was thinking about while I was writing it. But um, but I hope that that people will be able to relate to to both sides. But it's certainly telling that he rejected the idea of a Swedish folk horror slasher until he could thinly project his breakup onto it. Midsummer does explore some of those folk horror elements, but it does in a disjointed way. Like Edelstein says, the main character does find a kind of comfort in the cult, and a kind of place in the cult, and scenes of group sobbing and screaming are, are very affecting. But the film could have been improved a lot, I feel, if Aster had leaned more into the folk horror elements outside of an aesthetic and outside of a skeleton on which to build his really weird personal breakup movie. Gareth Evans, who directed Apostle, sounded so excited and happy about the folk horror films that he had seen and incorporating those into his vision for Apostle. Well, what were some of your inspirations? Like, obviously Wicker Man, I think. Yeah, right. Wicker Man is definitely. Um, what else was in that stew? Um, I mean, a lot of those British folk horror films, so The Wicker Man and Witchfinder General as well. And then, um, more importantly, probably Ken Russell's The Devils, which I had not seen until 2016 when we were just about to start working on this. And was a massive sort of inspiration then, because I was just blown away by that film. I had never seen it before, didn't right. know what to expect. And then it just came out of nowhere. And Astor seems almost like embarrassed or hesitant to embrace them. And not that he has to embrace them, but why make a folk horror film if you don't want it to be a folk horror film? As an aside, a uh, shout out to Folk Horror Revival for being explicitly against fascism on their website. That's cool. If you have any interest in folk horror, you should check out that piece by Pachorik and the BFI piece I mentioned, links in the description. Also, I'm now the film correspondent for the podcast Struggle Session, and we did an episode on Midsommar if you want to hear more of my general opinion on the film. Link also in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon for ongoing donations and Ko-fi for one-time donations. And if you have any folk horror film recommendations, please leave them in the comments, because I'd like to branch out and maybe do a full video essay on the genre at some point, especially maybe like modern applications versus older ones. If you want to hear why I liked Hereditary so much, check out my review on it, which is still my favorite review I've ever written. Also, of course, linked in the description. And thank you for watching.